welcome back to the Dive Line podcast, episode three. I'm Jim, and at his home studio is Craig. Hello, and welcome back, everybody. Hello, Craig. So, just a recap of our last episode. We did the draw for the fleece, which Laurie Klaus won. Uh, she's in Colorado Springs, and she was telling me it's uh, six inches of snow out there at the moment. So. Um, she'll she'll appreciate the fleece when we can get to there. I don't think uh, there can be much diving there in Colorado, up in the mountains. There's certainly uh, it'll be altitude diving. Does she dive local? Yeah, well, no, she did say. Uh, I had a quite a nice conversation with Laurie, and she said the the nearest place is uh, four and a half hours away, and it is at about fourteen hundred feet. Wow. Yeah, so um, it is definitely altitude diving. Otherwise, they've got to travel around, get on a plane. And, and fly somewhere so um, she did say she was looking forward to maybe coming to the UK doing a dry suit course and diving over here. Oh, that will be great for us to show her around but uh, well done Laurie in winning the fleece we'll have that off to you as soon as we're able to to get it dispatched. Absolutely so yeah well done. Um, so yeah Laurie won the fleece we spoke about equipment didn't we and doing checks on equipment um, before we go diving whenever that may be. And we also talked about some of the positive news for the environment. So that was all really good. And the resources that are available to all the divers. Yeah, and great to see what's come out from SSI, Paddy, Raid, and, and many others in putting some fantastic resources uh, out there on the uh, internet so uh, divers can occupy themselves whilst we're all in lockdown. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So that's what we spoke about on the last episode. On this episode, we've got our first guest, which we're quite excited about. We've got Marcus coming in. So Marcus is a master instructor. He used to be a guide on many different liverboards all around the world. So we got him coming on to talk about what it's like to be a guide. Yeah, really looking forward to that coming up very shortly because uh, Marcus has dived from uh, and instructed from Australia to the Orkney Islands above Scotland. So from north to south, he's got some incredible experience, but a lot of time on board boats. And so um, all of us are climbing the walls, wanting to go diving, are thinking about where we can go. And people have been mentioning liverboards. So uh, it'll be a great eye opener and uh, that'll come up very shortly. Yeah, and I'm sure we'll have, uh, have a few funny stories to go along with that as well. So that's coming up shortly. We're going to be talking about, you've got a nice story, haven't you, about some jellyfish? Yeah, some interesting jellyfish facts and uh, uh, following on from last week, how the environment is, is looking after itself and, uh, and dramatically improving with the, the lockdown and the lack of people. Uh, some, some interesting jellyfish facts and uh, a news story from uh, Palawan, Philippines. Excellent. So we'll look forward to that. And we're going to be talking about nitrox because that's something that you see very often on liverboards. And if you're not trained properly, you won't be able to use it. No, we'll talk about the benefits of the nitrox course and uh, what, what it actually gives you extra as a diver. Absolutely. Yeah. So before we crack on with Marcus, obviously, we want to have a, see what you've been up to. Uh, it's not going to be a lot. I know with lockdown, but I've been... I have had a few um, theory sessions online via Zoom and taught some theory sessions, which is really good. Really enjoyed those. It was a bit strange doing it that way um, without all our, our tools and our aids to, to teach properly, but I think it went well. And obviously the usual sort of popping out on your bike and taking the dog for a walk uh, other than working. I haven't really done, done much else. What about you? Yeah, like you, Jim, I've been out on the cycle trying to keep the pounds down because we're sitting at home eating mar far too much. And uh, also I've been taking the dogs out uh, for uh, a walk every evening and we normally wait until it gets dark to do that. Um, but also for those who have seen our YouTube channel and, and my video diving at home, uh, for those that haven't had a look at that, it's already had over 5,000 views uh, did a little bit of diving during the week uh, actually in the back garden so uh, it's only a minute long have a look at that okay so we found out what was uh, in the last episode what's coming up in this episode and as we said just a moment ago our first guest and first interview is with Marcus by the power of zoom all in our separate locations because of social distancing but we've got Marcus here, who was the main host of Scuba Confidential podcast and the brains behind that. 
He's joining <laughs> us today. And Craig's joining us. Hello, Marcus. Hi, guys. How are you doing? Yeah, we're doing great. Uh, uh, thank you, Marcus. Uh, uh, just very strange that we're all in these different locations, but thanks to the power of technology, we were able to do this, but appreciate you coming on. No, absolutely. It's, it's a pleasure to have a chat with you guys. We go back quite a way, us, the three of us, and um, it's nice to actually see your faces. And um, as you said, with, with the current shutdown, everyone is thinking about diving they want to do in the future. So it's a great opportunity to talk about some aspects of that, I think. What have you been up to in this lockdown? Uh, there's there's not much you can do. I mean, have you been anywhere nice? <laughs> <laughs> no, apart from walking the dogs, I haven't been very far at all. So I think, as 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 with everyone else, it's it's very very strange times we, we live in. Um, probably like a lot of people as well, you, you're getting very very itchy feet. So I've been scanning various holiday destinations and diving destinations with a view to well, hopefully when all this blows over. In a, in a few weeks and uh, things start to return to normal, where where would I like to go, you know? Um, and I'm sure a lot of people are doing that in their downtime. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when you look at the things people were interacting with online, um, you can see everyone's talking about travel and holiday. Yeah and dive locations and, and, and livables, which we're going to speak about specifically, is obviously uh, a huge part of that, people planning where, where they're going to go. Before we do that, for those that don't know you, tell us about you and, and your dive career and where you started. Yeah, sure. So I don't want to bore people with, with uh, an, an overlong history of me um, because we want to actually talk about the, the diving topic itself. But as a brief kind of snapshot, of my role in diving probably about 20 years ago or so I, I had my first few dives and just got the bug carried on through the various um, continuing education courses and eventually about 15 years ago found myself as a dive professional and it led me I'm very sort of proud and lucky to say to working in various parts of the globe both running dive centers training divers working on various liverpool boats in different parts of the world. Um, eventually, I think about nine years ago, I might be slightly wrong, I haven't checked my certificates recently. Um, I was made a master instructor, so I was then able to help instructors to be become instructors and, and coach professional candidates. Was that by accident, Marcus, that you started going aboard a liverboard or, or did something happen with an interview or, or did you plan that, that way forward? Um, well, I think if you speak to a lot of people in the diving industry, sometimes they end up in it by accident. And, and by me, for me personally, my route towards becoming a professional full time was really that I was enjoying teaching um, in my spare time, weekends and evenings. And I just had a change in personal circumstances. And combined with that, um, I was offered a job to go and work in Cyprus back in about 2007, 2008, I forget the exact year. And one thing sort of leads to another where you, you go and work in a different environment, you gather experience and knowledge um, and you enjoy it. And if, you, if you're reasonable at what you do, you then get offered other roles. You then have that on your resume just as you would in any other industry. So I found that then I ended up working in Thailand, for example, um, on, on different liverboard boats and for, for different dive centers. And also in the summer season in the UK, I would work up at Scapa Flow and work with uh, the guys up there. So I kind of got the best of both worlds. I was quite lucky in that, that that happened quite naturally and organically. And it wasn't something I specifically planned. It was just the way life turned out at that stage. Uh -huh. You mentioned Scapa Flow there. Obviously, you, you worked up there for quite a long time, didn't you? Uh, yeah. Several years. And know it quite well that was um and we, we've spoken about this uh, a couple of times that we can actually for those that are interested in the, the history of those um world war one wrecks and and bits and pieces we can maybe do another episode uh, in the future to talk more about scapa flow obviously with yeah. your knowledge and experience i'd be very happy to do so i mean there'll be people listening who who perhaps aren't aware of what scapa flow is um, essentially, it's a body of water about 120 square miles off the north coast of Scotland, um, with the Orkney Islands and the surrounding islands that are there, Hoy and such like. And it forms like a natural harbour. And over the centuries, it's been used as such. But really, during the two world wars, it came to the fore. And, and there's, there's a prolific history and 
and uh, some very very impressive wrecks that are still there to this day. Um, and certainly, if you if you if you'd like me to, I'll be happy to come on and talk about my experiences. Um, yeah, we'd love love to do that. I think that'd be such an interesting episode. Um, there's parts of Scapa Flow and history that I don't know about. I'm sure others don't. So to get a more in depth view on that would be pretty awesome. I think. Yeah, no problem. So, Marcus, really looking forward to hearing some of your experiences from your perspective as being a leader on Liverboard. But for all these people sitting at home now deciding on what perhaps might even be their first Liverboard, mm. what should they expect? How should they pack? What do they take? What, what's it like from a, a customer's perspective? Yeah, so that, that's a very good question. Um, the first thing to say for people who are perhaps new to diving is what is Liverboard? Um, and it's pretty much what it says on the tin. You, you board a vessel and generally you're then offshore for a period of time. You, you, you don't go back to land, you live on board the vessel. If you're about to, to go on one of these trips, then doing your research and working out what you want to take and what the style of diving is, is pretty imperative because it's not, an, it's not a, a shop offshore where you can just buy bits of equipment you need. It's not somewhere where there are dozens of different wetsuits to choose from or bits of equipment you need to do your preparation before you you get there so you you can't just go and buy uh, a spare fin strap or a mask strap or a new mask exactly right and, and we'll, we'll get to some of those challenges i'm sure when you, when i we speak a little bit later about what it's like to to run a liverboard as a trip leader or a cruise director um if if you're a customer going on a liverboard the first thing as you rightly said is to, is to, to pack correctly now, I don't want to go too far down the road of, of, you know, individually talking about equipment and how you might wrap it up necessarily and pack it in your bags. We can we can touch on that. But really, the most important thing is to research the dive environment you're going to. Have a look. Find out what the water temperature is where you're going. What do you need to pack in terms of exposure? Think about the regulators you're going to use. If you're traveling, you may have a, a travel set of regulators that are lighter, but they need to be something that's appropriate for the environment. You need, for example, if you're then about to travel to Scapa Flow, you're going to need regs that are cold water rated. Similarly, if you go into somewhere um, in the world where there are currents and there may be diving with a lot of water movement, I would never dive with one, without one anyone, and you guys have spoke about it on previous episodes, but you need to have a, a DSMB and reel, and preferably a backup as well. Computers, um, I always take two computers. You know, when you're when you're 50 kilometres offshore on a liverboard boat, is it, just popping down the road to Dixon's or ordering a, a new battery off Amazon is just not going to happen. <laughs> Making sure you've you've got spares of what you need to take with you. In terms of the actual packing of stuff, Craig, you've probably got some tips on that as well because you travel a lot with with diving. Well, yeah. I mean, the first thing about computers make sure you know how to use the thing i mean yeah. <laughs> you know don't buy a new new brand new computer and then go off on a liverpool next week and then you know how does this work i mean my, from a travel point of view the one thing i would always recommend is never pack your eggs in your hold luggage um you know the just the the, the freezing cold environment and an aircraft hold minus 50 degrees um doesn't do them any good i always put my my regs inside some t-shirts and inside my hand luggage and keep control of those expensive bear kit to, to be putting in the in the hold yeah i think that's pretty sound advice um the, the only thing you're going to have to get used to if you're doing that as a diver is being stopped at every security checkpoint and, and having to unpack them and explain to someone who's probably English isn't their first language exactly what they are. Um, but if you go into somewhere where they're familiar with divers, that they'll they'll know they'll know what they are. Just <laughs> obviously, if you've got a dive knife clipped to your LPI hose, make sure you take it off before you try. And <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Otherwise, you, you may end up in a separate room um, with someone with a latex glove, and no one wants that. <laughs> no. Um, okay, yeah. so there are certain considerations you need to think about before you 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 leave and get to the um, destination and the mm. Liverpool. But once you once you've done that, you've done all your research, you've done all your packing, you've got mm. all the right equipment that you need to take with you. You step off the aeroplane onto your coach and they take you to transfer you to your liverboard as a customer from a customer perspective. And those mm. that maybe are planning to go on a liverboard or haven't been on a liverboard mm. before, um, what can a customer expect when they turn up? Um, well, actually travelling to the, the liverboard vessel itself, if you're lucky and you've got a, a pre-booked luxury 
trip with transfers from the airport. As you said, you, you'll arrive in a coach and you'll be escorted to wherever the check-in point is. Um, the first thing to say is when you arrive, there is a, a little bit of admin and safety and, and also some dive etiquette to be aware of. So the, the liverboard boat itself, when you physically go to board it, if, if that's your first point of contact with the, the dive crew and the, the crew of the vessel, that is their home. I, I've spent times when I've lived pretty much six months at a time on a boat. Occasionally you get a day off and you go back to land overnight or something like that. But that's their home. So before you board the boat or at the first opportunity when you get on board, just remove your shoes because yeah. that, that, that's their home. That's a, that's a respect thing. Um, if you want to be particularly nice and I always recommend it, just learn some basic phrases for the places you go into. Now, if you go into Australia or when you speak <laughs> English, it's not an issue, but if you're flying into um, Egypt or Thailand or another part of the world where English isn't the first language, just being able to say thank you and please and, and these kind of things is really useful and will pay you dividends. You then usually have a, a boat briefing and have to go through some admin. Now, you talked about putting regs in your hand luggage. Put your cert cards in there as well in your logbook because one of the first things that happens is you're going to be greeted by someone like me who's going to want to have a little chat with you, have a look at your cert card and work out who they're dealing with because at that stage, if you're in a marine park where all the, the dives are then guided, I'm then thinking about, okay, how am I going to allocate the, the various divers to the various guides and put appropriate divers together. There's no point having experienced guys like you in a group with someone who's an open water diver with five dives because your dive will then be compromised and vice versa. So I'm looking at the experience level of the divers. There'd then be a boat briefing. And for boat briefings, for people who are new to liverboards, particularly, and I still do it, I tend to just have a pad and pen in front of me or, or the back page of my logbook or whatever it is, and just note down details. A lot of people, when they board, of course, you're on holiday and you're really excited and they're like, OK, I want to get a cold beer. I want to set my equipment up, blah, blah, blah. That's really key that those opening moments, because that's when you're going to find out not just facility things like, you know, marine toilets and how they function, or where your cabin is, but also the emergency details. Yeah. You know? Where's the first aid? Where's the O2? What happens in the event of a fire? They're becoming more... Um, a professional slick with these now and a lot of the times i'll have a video presentation on on liverboard boats but many times it'll just be someone like me briefing the group of say 20 divers who are on board that boat and explaining to them point by point where you know how the boat functions so if, if you're unsure if you've not been on this boat before scribble down some notes for your own reference i, I think it's uh, at that point as well when you're doing it's time for those divers to get to know you as well you know, you're the one who's going to be running the vessel for the for that week. If it's a seven day uh, liverboard, they need to get to know you and how yeah. you tick and how you work. That briefing will also tell them where they need to be for the week. They'll have a spot allocated to them, possibly. Yeah. Or they yeah. need to pick one, and that's theirs for the week, isn't it? Um, yeah. yeah. Where the gas analyzers are, if they're using nitrox, all sorts of things. That briefing is is so important. Yeah, that's very true, Jim. I think it's also, for a lot of people, the first opportunity that they've had to meet each other. Um, lots of liverboards are, are a group from a dive club, perhaps, that have gone and all know each other anyway. But but I've been on lots of liverboards where there are lots of singletons, and you know they, they just turn up on their own. As me, I've never gone on a dive trip with a... Uh, a liberal with a buddy um, so that's that first opportunity where you can you know get to meet your, your fellow divers at the same time it's because yeah. nobody wants to dive with you Craig I knew that <laughs> um, but I didn't want to say it yeah exactly <laughs> well I've managed to avoid it so far <laughs> oh excellent that's a joke that's a joke by the <laughs> way before, before he cuts me off from the meeting yeah. end meeting <laughs> <laughs> I think you're right what you said, guys. It's, it's, it's a, people are also sussing each other out at that stage as well. And if you are a singleton and you've gone on a trip, you might be thinking, who do I want to buddy with? And you're trying to, you're trying to be a bit of a Columbo and make assessments of the, the people you, who are on the boat and who looks like someone sensible who I feel I can trust to, to dive with. But that, that boat briefing is really important. You're going to get all the key information you need. So just pay attention at that point. You know, it's it's all everything safety related 
should be covered at that stage. Not necessarily diving procedures. That normally comes on the first morning or before the first dive in terms of a, an actual dive briefing and how the dive procedures work. Yeah, I mean, that's fairly straightforward. Like Craig said, I think um, when you go as part of a group, the group organiser normally takes care of everything and, and mm -hmm. so it's not so bad. It's more if you're, you're booking trips on your own or as a couple, then you, you probably need to be more aware of, of these briefings, don't you? But yeah. So yeah. are all the reports the same? Are they the same? You know, if I go to Egypt, is the liverboard the same as if I went to the Maldives or to Mexico? Uh, there's always similarities and most of the differences you, you find when you go into to different vessels are environment and budget. So if you go into somewhere like the Maldives, for example, the, the generally the liverboard vessels there are, are quite salubrious. Um, you, people pay a subs quite a substantial amount of money to be on those 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 vessels you'll have cabins that are air conditioned that have tvs and dvds and then have their own kind of toilet and bathroom facilities and are slightly more comfortable if you're going to on a budget liverboard often you just have a very basic bunk in a room and that's it and perhaps the toilet and bathroom facilities are shared air conditioning may or may not be there you know so it just depends on your budget um, similarly the dive deck and the facilities that you'll get on a liverboard will depend on budget and environment. So for someone like Craig, who's an avid photographer, having a proper table for your camera, plug-in points, these kind of things and rinse rinse tanks will, will come as you go higher up the price bracket. The spaciousness and the facilities are what, what, what come with that. If you think about somewhere like the Maldives, for example, it would differ from, say, the Red Sea. In the Red Sea, a lot of the diving, you would enter straight from the back of the main vessel or you might be dropped on a Zodiac. You'd be on a donny if, if you're in the Maldives and they would have a, a slightly larger vessel trailing which all the diving would be conducted from and your kit would be set up on it so there, you'll get variations depending on the environment you, you're in and just be prepared for that you know research before you go if you go in there and, and, and you're expecting luxury and it's a budget liverboard and you've got to share a bathroom with you know five or ten other people I've, I've certainly I've, I've worked on various types of liverboards and if you if you're getting up in the morning and you, you've got to join a queue to go to the toilet or have a shave then it's, it's it's slightly more frustrating but it's like most things you pay your money you take your choice just do your research before you go and make sure you, you're getting the vessel you want w within that you've also got platform liverboards versus your standard liverboards so a platform liverboard for, for people who don't know would often stay out around the islands or the reefs that they're touring for that period of the season and then a speedboat or or similar would, would kind of ferry people out on a day-by-day -day basis so they can join at any point and the itinerary just carries on during the season and so there, there, there are different types and different different aspects of liverboards like that. This may seem like a silly question but why would you go on a liverboard? I think the main thing is they are completely focused on diving if you go on a day boat, the one that's going from land, um, it doesn't mean it's not focused on diving because obviously it's geared to diving. There'll be the equipment and safety facilities on board you should have. But often it's put part of a more of an excursion. It may be someone who's traveling with their, their partner or their children and perhaps the children will be out there to go snorkeling that day. The wife might be there to, to sunbathe or the husband or vice versa. And only perhaps one of two or three people on board might be actually doing the diving. And it's more of an event where people go out there to do that. And you might get a couple of dives and then you'll come back in the afternoon. Yeah. Whereas if you're on a liverboard, there's, there's an old mantra of dive, eat, sleep, repeat, which every dive center in the world has stolen for their t-shirt. Um, because that's pretty much how it is. You'll get four dives a day and, and you, you go through that cycle. It's and awesome. it's great, isn't it? That's oh. what you <laughs> That is great. It is eat, sleep, dive, repeat. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, I, I think the, the, the other thing for, for me, the, the greatest experience of, of a liverboard is those dives that you, you get to do at different times of the day. Normally, if you go out diving, you, you do a morning dive and an afternoon dive, perhaps maybe even three in a day. On a liverboard, that, that first early morning dive before breakfast, the, the 6 a.m. up, gear mm -hmm. on, in the water, yeah. having just had a cup of coffee, come back from that dive and have breakfast. But that early morning dive isn't one you'd normally ever get to experience. Yeah. And it's a completely different dive. The, 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 you know, the marine life that you will see will be different. The lighting is different. And the same with the night dive in the evening 
Yeah, well, I agree with that entirely. And and for me personally, that that morning, that dawn dive is my favourite one of the day. Me um, too. I yeah. really see. I prefer the night dive. I yeah, much I prefer the night dive. Loved it. Yeah. You you won't find too many working guides who, who like night dives. It's not because <laughs> for any other reason than it means we it's effectively doing overtime for us because we then have, our day goes on a little bit longer looking after people. Selfish. Um, Selfish. Uh, That's what that, that the dawn dive and, and, and a sunset dive as well, if you can get a sunset dive is good, because all the good stuff is either on its way to the office or coming back, and you, you often see it out and about, um, whereas the ones during the day, you, you kind of know what you're going to get more or less, I think. Um, to be but, honest, the ones in the morning, I did skip it at last Liverpool I went on, I skipped a few of the morning ones, because it, it's so early in the morning, and I'm on, I'm on holiday, I want to lie in. <laughs> Yeah. I can still have three dives in a day, which I wouldn't normally get unless you're teaching. Um, yeah. So to me, it's like, do I, I'm going to skip the morning one. I'm going to have a lie in, nice and fresh, catch a few rays before I go well, diving. I think that is the advantage of being a customer as opposed to working on it, that you, yeah. you get that choice. Um, yeah. I'm sure we'll talk about what the differences are later. But, you know, if, if I know I've got to wake people up at six o'clock and the briefing's at 6.30 or 7, it means I'm up as a crew member of, you know, half an hour, 45 minutes before that, going around the boat, checking all these various things. Everything's in place, tanks are full, blah, 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 before things actually take off. Well, I, I think that leads us in very nicely, Marcus, into what's the experience like from your perspective as a, a dive leader, a guide, living and working on board? Okay. Um, well, the, the, obviously, it's, a, it's in a lot of ways, it's a very lucky and privileged role to have and I was I was lucky to do that for several years the the, the reality of working on one of these boats is, is very different to the perception in that it is hard work um, there's a lot of customers out there obviously it's, it's, it's a floating hotel for a lot of customers in terms of their experience of it dive eat sleep repeat but there's a lot of things that go on behind the scenes that customers won't be aware of so the job of someone working on Liverpool, particularly someone who's a trip leader or cruise director, starts way before the customers set foot on the boat. Um, for, for me personally, I would normally arrive at the dive centre and let's say the customers were going to arrive at 7pm that evening. I'd be there a couple of hours before. I'd be going through weather reports. We'd be looking at tide times. We'd be looking at fuel, looking at supplies for the boat, whether that's O2 or food and drink and and, and just commodities you're going to need oh, on okay board. so as a as a trip leader then your your role is covering everything yes so everything from let's review the food on the last trip um were the quantities okay was the quality okay do we need to make changes to it arranging the right staff to come in to go on that that next run out of the harbour so for example a lot of the the trips I was running when I worked in Thailand, you might find out the final kind of guest list, if you like, an hour before they rock up. And at that point, while the guests are kind of waiting um, and they're on their way from the airport, perhaps myself and, and, and the, the management team at the dive centre would then be working. OK, well, what nationality are they? What instructors do we have who, who are going to speak their, their language, who are on our books, who might be able to communicate with them if English isn't? A language that they speak you know if you've got guests who are from china who are from france who are from germany and they don't speak english we need to have someone on board who i can allocate to them to be their guide for the next few days so so, that, so you do get to pick the team then you're not just put on there as the the trip leader or, or cruise director and and given a team you have input on who your team is so from the chef to the to the guys helping out running the zodiacs well, there's there's sort of a there's a split of of responsibilities in that respect. In that, on a on a, on a liverboard vessel, for example, the crew themselves, the guys who are actually the 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 the, the local guys who are in the zodiacs doing the pickups, um, who are working to to the engineers on the boat, these kind of guys, and the chef, they all fall under the captain's remit. So the captain will they report to the captain. But the dive crew themselves, the actual guides and instructors, would report to the trip leader or the cruise director. I mean, it's not every single, it's not set in stone. It just depends on the centre you're working for, of course. Like, companies have different structures. Um, but, for example, I would, at the beginning of each season, 
there'd be kind of like this rolling feast of of different guides working on my boat over the first three, four, five trips. And then I'll try and cherry pick the ones I thought were really good and hang on to them for subsequent trips. And they'd become my core bunch, my core, my gang. Do that's I knew that's like we do here. <laughs> well, that's yeah. like you do when we're training. Obviously, well, you always like, choose me, don't you? Of, of course, because you're the best, Jim. But um, if 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 in any industry, in the, what, what what anyone does day to day, you want you want a good team around you who understand how you work and are going to do the best for your customers. So, I would after a few trips, I'd get to know who I liked and who was you know who was on the the, the B list. Um, yeah. depending on if I needed someone for languages and these kind of things. But it's seven people who are safe, who you know are good in the water, who can look after the customers if there's a, if there's a particular issue. So the staffing, of course, the dive centre or the Liverpool company have the ultimate responsibility. It's their business. But they would take feedback from whoever's running the boat as to whether they felt that they were a good instructor or guide or dive master, depending on the role they were performing. So you get that kind of split. Um, yeah, and uh, that 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 happens way before the customers set foot anywhere near the boat. So I used to go to we used to have um, uh, Wind Guru and Magic Seaweed, and myself and the rest of the team would go through the the forecast for the next few days. What's the wind direction? What's the wave height? Where's it coming from? Because then that would determine the accessibility of certain dive sites that people might be expecting as you know some of the the star draws of that particular itinerary. Well, well, that's one of the questions I was going to ask. So once you've done all that, you've got all your supplies and you've got all the customers on board, you've got the right team in place. Yeah. How do you, I know you've got an itinerary, normally, yeah. but how do you choose the dives and the dive sites and when to do them? Because it will change depending on the weather and the environment. And Yeah, I mean, this is, this is a strange thing about running a boat is that people will go, let's say you've got a friend who's gone to the Red Sea recently. And they've done the Rex and Reefs tour, which is quite a popular one. Now, some of the choices of dive site will be made by pure geography and fuel cost. There's no point going from point A to point D to then come back to point B. You'll go with the, 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 the line of least resistance. But a lot of it will be decided on the divers you've got on board. It will be decided on the weather conditions and the wind direction. Um, and also the other boats that that you get to know as a trip leader and as a cruise director that are operating in the area and I know kind of roughly when they're going to be at dive sites so you're trying to coincide it so there aren't you're not overcrowding a dive site m tying it in with the wind tying it in with the tide tying it with the guests you've got um, and trying to give them the best experience from what okay. you've got available to you are you in contact with the other dive vessels and liaising with them in, in any way or you just know yeah. that they'll turn up at certain points well you, you'd get to know and um f for me um i used to know a lot of the other trip leaders because you just get to know them um believe it or not on land there'd be certain bars when you had time off where a lot of the trip leaders and instructors would hang out and you get to know these guys and girls and you you would talk about how it was going and things you'd experienced and there'd be like a little barter system of information where you'd, you'd find out oh, oh this particular site if you go there you might find a harlequin shrimp i saw one there the other day or whatever the, the the case may be and so there's an information exchange but also you've got you've got ship to shore radio you've got you've got right vhf radio on board so if i saw that the vessel of someone a trip leader i knew was in the area or heading in the opposite direction they'd then been to a dive site i would possibly if i was unsure about whether to make that call radio ask to speak to the trip leader and just have a brief chat on the radio about okay what are the conditions like there how is the current there at the moment is it ripping through there really strongly because that might not be suitable for the experience level of the guests i've got well that that's the key point isn't it that you're getting to marcus the, the whole trip everything you're with regards to your planning where you're going what you're doing all revolves around creating that best dive experience for the guys you've got on board for for that week so uh, and, th and that's you know really the only way you can run it that's great yeah. and, and you know you want your customers to to have the best experience what about the the etiquette and what do you expect back from from those divers you've gone out of your way to make sure this experience is as good as it could possibly be mm. for them clearly you must have an expectation of some some dive etiquette and liverboard etiquette yeah um 
for me, I mean, it doesn't have to be a military operation, but it's really just about, it's, it's a very closed environment being on a liverboard vessel. There's, there's not a lot of room to play with, particularly in the budget end of the market. So every, it's a little bit of give and take and cooperation and tolerance and just having a bit of respect for other people's space. Um, for, for me, as, as, as a trip leader on a liverboard, that opening dive briefing, it would normally be twice as long as a standard dive briefing because you'd want to get across some of the, the safety procedures for the vessel. You'd want to be sure that you, you've made clear to people what the rules of diving are on that boat. And once you've done that, you just expect people to abide by it. You only get problems when people don't do that. So there's basic things. You would normally set a maximum depth limit. You would normally set a maximum time limit. You would ensure that everyone was aware they had to do a buddy check, that everyone had to do a safety stop at the end of the dive, five meters for a minimum of three minutes, that they needed to fire up an SMB. Whatever the, the, the particular dive procedure was, that they are aware of it. And then you've got the general stuff that you learn at open water level. If you get separated from your group, you look around for a minute, and then if you haven't found your guide or your guide hasn't found you, you abort the dive. And I've heard of that one. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and you'd be amazed how many people that just goes out of the window sometimes on, on when they're on holiday. Um, so it's just reinforcing yeah. things that people should already know. Apart from that, it's just having a bit of respect for people's space. The dive decks are often quite cosy. Um, so if you've got gear, making sure it's secured and that you haven't left your weight belt on someone else's box, that you haven't just sprawled out across the dive deck because it's just about being um, a little bit respectful of other people's area, other people's equipment. And as long as people do that, then usually things run really smoothly. But a liveaboard trip, if you're on board for, say, four, five, six days, can be the best thing ever if you've got the right group of people who, who have a nice attitude and, and are really diving in a nice way and friendly. But you can have a floating asylum if you've got the, the wrong people on board and there's conflict. It can be your job can become something being something of a diplomat or a, or a policeman on board to, to yeah, watch. I'm sure you must have some tales to tell in that respect. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's been numerous occasions when things will happen and maybe the other guests aren't even aware of it, but you, you can have situations where, um, you know, someone is, is diving outside of the limits or they're crashing into the reef repeatedly or not taking advice from their particular guide. Who's a member of my staff and just ignoring depth limits. It could be any combination of, of things. Um, where you, you have to try and as delicately as you can try and get people to see the error of their ways. Do, do you think that's down to um, not listening to briefings properly? Because, you know, there's there's an element of, of new divers, even experienced divers, that maybe think they don't need to listen. Because mm. those briefings, as we said right at the beginning, they're so important yeah. for that particular dive and that particular dive site. Um, that you do get divers that don't tend to listen or they're chatting all the way through it or or they've not even turned up for it is that does that is that the sort of stem of most of the issues yeah i think there's there's you you it tends to fall into two categories you'll either get um people well three categories actually if i think about it you'll either get people who are, who are inexperienced and it's an honest mistake they they just didn't know or they didn't understand and you really that's an educational thing where if something's gone wrong I'll try and find a discreet moment and you know catch them on their own on the dive deck or over a coffee and say hey that, that I saw that went a little bit wrong for you on that dive this is this is a solution for it you'll get people who are perhaps moderately experienced and think they perhaps don't need to know anymore what do they need to know they've been on half a dozen liverboards already and of are we course, talking about Freddy Krueger here and Dunning Kruger <laughs> You get that Dunning-Kruger effect sometimes. That doesn't mean that I know everything or necessarily a dive guide does. It just means each environment is different. And if I go to a different environment or a different boat or a different region, I sit there taking notes, like I said, at every yeah. briefing, so I know what's going on. Um, and then you'll get people who are just deliberately causing 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 problems. The, the other aspect, of course, as well, is it's, it's a multicultural and, and multinational sport. So it might just be a language barrier. It might be that you've done you've done the briefing to the best of your ability. And if I'm talking to a group who are a mixed nationality, I'll trim down my the speed of my speech and, and the words I use and try and make it as simple and straightforward as I can for them. 
but something might just be lost in translation and it might be an honest mistake just due to a language barrier but it, whatever wherever it arises then the site the dive safety on the boat the buck would rest with with me and the safety of the, the boat itself is with the captain so between us we need to address whatever the issue is yeah, I think I think that uh, the dive briefing is key. You know, so you're setting your stall out right from the start. Do you ever suffer with divers that are late for the briefings? Mm -hmm. That is that is a pet peeve. I've got I've got about half a dozen, and there'll be if there's any dive guides and instructors listening to this, they'll just be nodding in agreement. But the the, the briefing is is absolutely critical for the reasons we've spoken about. This is where you get all the information to make sure you have a safe dive, you have a good dive. But people being late for briefings, it sort of astounds me a little bit um, because usually, certainly I used to have like a, a big flat screen TV in the middle of, of the, the deck upstairs, the open area, where I'd have a rolling slideshow of the dive sites that were coming up, dive procedures, and also, I'd have a big whiteboard where I'd put in, in, a, in a marker when the next briefing was. And really all people need to do is make sure they're there for that briefing. I'd even ring, go get one of my crew to go around ringing a bell, walk around the whole boat ringing a bell for, you know, 10 minutes before to make sure they're there. And, and what's critical about that is the, some of the aspects behind the scenes that a customer might not have thought about is, I've already liaised with another boat and told them we'll be entering the water at this time at that site, but we should be clear so they can go in at X time. Or I may know that there's a tide change or conditions change or any any number of variables could mean that we we really need to be in the water at a particular time. And if someone decides they're they're not going to be there on time for the briefing, because maybe they've just they're having a kip or they can't be bothered to tell me they don't want to dive that time and the thing's delayed by 15 20 minutes then that has a knock-on effect for every single diver on that boat so it can be can be a bit of an annoyance yeah so, absolutely I, that's actually worse than being late is that if you're going to skip a dive like jim mentioned yeah. and you don't even turn up because you you know you're going to skip the dive but you haven't told anybody else and they're all sitting there waiting for you in that briefing sorry jim you were going to say yeah, I just think, I mean, on the liverboards I've been on, it's not just the ones that are late. I've sat there trying to listen to a briefing. Um, you know, I'm moderately experienced, and but I don't necessarily know the dive site, so I need to listen. But I've got the guy next to me, you know, chattering away, chattering away, and I, I don't hear particularly well. So and I tend to miss a lot of stuff on the briefings as well. That's yeah. my excuse, and I'm sticking to it. Uh -huh. I, I mean, there are... How do you deal with that? So you've got people who are late, you've got people who haven't listened and run into potential issues. How do you deal with that for well, the next time? You, you, you've got a few things at your disposal. You, you, the first thing, obviously, is to be polite and diplomatic and say, you know, if you're not going to do the dive, you just need to let me know. If you're not feeling it, when you hear the bell ringing, just tell a member of staff that you're not going to make that dive. If you're 10 minutes before you've decided you're not going to, fine, we the guides are more than happy for any of the guests and preferably all of them not to dive and they'll just go <laughs> diving themselves <laughs> on their own with, with as guides and just have a great hour underwater but um if you don't want to do it just let someone know if someone is sort of a repeat offender let's say you, you're doing a briefing and someone is talking over the top of it it's a bit like being a stand-up comedian and you just end up with this repertoire of comebacks and put downs to, to deal with people and I'm sure you guys in your experience as dive masters have, and instructors have had this where you, you need to have a series of quips for putting people down and the ultimate one is for, for me if anyone who's seen pictures old pictures of me doing a briefing I was just, because of the language barrier I used to say I'm open in dive briefing here is my briefing hat when I put this hat on it's your time to shut up and my time to talk and if someone yeah. repeatedly just talks over me I'll, I'll take the hat off I'll beckon them up in front of the whole group. Put them, put the hat on them. And I put the hat on them and say, right, everyone, actually, Bob's decided he's going to do this briefing and I'll stand back. And then as they slowly start to crumble in front of the 20 people who are watching them, I'll then take the hat back and you can sit down again. But it's, it's just a, it's a question of degrees of how you deal with, with, these sort of, with these sort of issues. Really, you don't want it to be like a military operation. You want it to be fun. But at the same time, you've got important safety stuff you need to get across. So it's, it's striking that balance and it's not an exact science. It depends on the group you've got. 
I've had people who've seen the funny side and we've had a, we've had a laugh about it afterwards. And I've had people who've taken umbrage at me being sort of a bit cheeky or sarcastic and have written a horrible review on TripAdvisor. It's, 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 again, it's, you, you're never going to get it right all the time. You can't please everyone all the time. Someone yeah. made a proverb about that. But um, yeah. Yeah, so so be, being on time for the briefing, be, be, being courteous to actually sit and listen to the briefing and not having your own private chats. And if you're not going to actually dive, let other, uh, you know, you, you mentioned a member of staff, but even a dive buddy or another member of the, the guests just to say, tell them that I'm not coming and, and at least somebody knows and can pass that information on. Yeah. So that, that, that's the late diver. What's next on your on your, on your list of, of uh, getting the shotgun out for? Oh, it's a, it's a a floating commune of divers you've just got to be a bit respectful of other people's space um a, a good tip i always say to people was if they're new to liverboards or maybe they're not even aware of it is when you get back after the dive and you've secured all your equipment you've made sure to let the crew know if you're having nitrox or air or whatever it is you want for the next dive whatever the procedure is once you've done what you need to do just vamoose off the dive deck because that's a working area where the guys need to get the whips out to fill tanks, where they need to be on standby in case there's a diver who's not come back, who is missing or AWOL or whatever, and they need to quickly act and do something about that. So just leave the dive deck as soon as you can and, and be respectful of other people's space. You know, there's, there's obviously little tips you guys will know, like, you know, clipping your mask to your, your BCD strap and all these kind of things so that things are secured or anything of, of weight is, is down low and inside one of the crates you'll often find on, on these sort of dive vessels so it doesn't roll around and land on people's feet. Um, but just being respectful of people's space and it, it can drive, it, drive people mad and it leads to more frustration. I'm sure you've all been on a boat somewhere when the guide's gone, okay guys, everyone ready, we're about to, everyone done your buddy checks, time to go. And then someone's gone, I can't find my weight belt. And, and, and it's just it's just a typical thing where if if people are just just get a bit organised about it, it's just get a bit organised. Yeah, that 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 can be so frustrating, particularly if you're not jumping off of the dive deck. If you everyone half the people are in the zodiac, the other half are about to get on the zodiac, and one guy goes running off because he's he was cleaning his mask on the top deck, and it's like, ah, oh, for God's sake. Yeah, you will get that, you know, or everyone's ready to go sometimes if you if you're diving from the main vessel um you often take particularly in a, an environment i used to work in the captain i would be signaling the captain um and the crew would we you may you may or may not know this you may have observed this but often on the dive decks and on the dive platforms they'll have little webcams up and there'll be a feed going through to the, the skipper of the boat the captain of the boat and he'll have a series of tv screens on the on in the bridge and we're signaling to him so we'll look around and I'll be looking to my, the guides. Perhaps I say I've got three guides on board working with me. I'll look to the guides and they'll, they'll, they'll be checking and asking, say, the three or four divers they're guiding in each individual group, are they ready? And when they confirm they're ready, the guide will give me a little nod. And when I've got the, the nod of all three other groups that they're ready, we then signal to the captain. The captain brings the boat into position. If, and so we're at a split point of a current the captain's put it into neutral. We've got a limited window to then get all those divers into the water. So they should be buddy checked, masks on, fins on, ready to rock and roll. If someone at that point goes, all right, sure, I've left my computer in the cabin, then that just throws everything out. The captain then has to, we have to abort, put the boat into gear, burn another load of fuel, doing another loop around while this, while this is being resolved again. So it's just yeah. a bit of preparation beforehand. you know. And then that, that guy had to doesn't have an, any idea why everybody's so peeved with him. Yeah. I, I, I really did doesn't it know once. any of that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did it once and I learned my lesson. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. But then you've got, say, this one guy and then 19 other people who stood there in the heat with the weight on their back of all their equipment, rocking and rolling if there's yeah. a bit of water movement, waiting to, then it might be another five, between five and 10 minutes to then circle around, get in position. We might be waiting. It's a bit like a, bringing a plane into land. If, if, if there's happens to be another couple of boats, you want to circle into position and do the same thing. You've then missed your spot in the queue and you've got to then kind of come bring the, yeah. bring the, the vessel about and, and find a position radio across, find us to get to that split point to drop us in. So there's, there's all these multiple factors that can happen, but yeah, if people aren't prepared in respectful of space. 
the in-water stuff is probably scarier because it can be dangerous. I was going to say that the in-water stuff, I mean, everybody's seen it on every liverboard, I'm sure. There's that one diver that seems to have forgotten every single thing he's been taught about diving. <laughs> and well, there isn't it. They, they, they just plough into everybody and everything. Yeah. They, they smash the reefs to bits. They, yeah. you know, and they are out there. And they, you can't avoid the fact that they are out there. Yeah. Um, but they continue to do it. And nobody then wants to dive with them. How do, what do you do about that? Because we all get frustrated by that. Yeah. And you can see it. And, you know, it's not necessarily our place to tell them that they're doing it wrong unless it continues. But how do you, you will see that as a guide yeah a, a trip leader and you you know it'll be more frustrating for you seeing your your back garden getting broken up yeah that's absolutely right i mean this is sort of a phenomenon i call it like mutiny beneath the waves where people um just get in the water and, and as you said disregard anything you've said in the briefing and there there are there are dozens of different aspects to that um some more dangerous than others if it's someone who perhaps is, you know, a reef wrecker, who's someone who's always touching and kicking the reef, it's to begin with, for, for me at least, you've got to be a little bit uh, mindful of people's experience level and skill level. So if it's someone who clearly is struggling, you can offer them some tips and try and help them and give them kind of a little bit of a free education on how to perhaps manage their buoyancy or their finning technique to avoid it happening. If, if you're guiding that group and you know that person is a bit of a liability in terms of damage to the environment, I would just take them to um, bring them slightly clearer of anything delicate. I'd take them perhaps on a slightly different route around the site. I'd manage that dive slightly differently. Or if it was a member of my, my staff who I was DMing perhaps and taking a group around, I'd offer them a few tips. So, hey, you might have noticed, um, I don't know, pick a name, Francois is having a bit of trouble. <laughs> with it with his feet yeah. um perhaps just keep an eye on him maybe bring him up closer to you at the front of the group so you can monitor him yeah. and ask one to have a discreet word and ask one of the experienced dive in your group to just be at the back um but if you've got repeat offenders that upsets other members on the boat as well people who've paid for that holiday you know how frustrating it is when you see uh someone who's on the boat you're on doing damage then it can be infuriating and and the, the the guides and the people running the boat have sort of a responsibility i think to educate people and address that now i've, I've done it in the past in different ways um i had was once um running a vessel and i was looking after a group of these finnish guys and they actually really really sound guys and very very good divers but there was a diver in another group who was repeatedly sort of grabbing hold of the coral to take pictures and kicking things up and this kind of thing and they came to me, they'd seen it more blatantly than I had and reported it to me. It's like, well, I can't just go up to this woman and, and say, well, you, your buoyancy is terrible, never darken my door again, because I've got this person on board for the next three or four days. But all I did was um, ask the person leading that group to keep an eye. And also I made sure, unbeknownst to this person, that, that her group got in just before my group and I followed them around and just observed it for myself, made a little note, okay, this happened at this time, at this depth. And, any, and, and I began just to gather some data. And then when I was sure that I, it wasn't just hearsay and I'd observed it myself, I then tried to have a word with this person and say, look, on this occasion, these occasions I've noted down, you, you, you've made contact and it's, it's not healthy for the reef and blah, blah, blah. Inevitably, people don't react well and again I mean, I'm, not, I'm not talking i mean with newer divers and those with less experience you know you can help them along can't you and you can point yeah. out some of the things and better ways of doing it and you know as well as we do that you know sometimes your buoyancy does take a while to get used to and if they're only 30 dives in they might still need a little bit of coaxing and a little bit of help and that's fine it's just those guys on deck that have all that experience and they've been diving for years and tell everybody where they've been, what they've done, how many thousands of dives they've done, mm. but they still wreck the reefs. They're the people that, you know, that you have to deal with. Yeah. It's slightly harder because they have got that experience as they call it. It's harder, but at the end of the day, I always think of it, um, well, at least my perception, it depends on the company you're with and their attitude towards the environment and your interaction with it. 
I've been lucky in that a lot of the places I've worked, they've been have had really positive um, policy on these kind of things. Um, but I think I view it a little bit like if you're the landlord of a pub and someone is repeatedly causing trouble, you can stop serving them drinks. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, um, can you put them in a room? Are you allowed to put them in a room and beat them? Well, I, I think physically beating might be frowned upon. I'm not uh, sure. That's, but I don't think Carl Paddy would condone that. But um, yeah, I think that depends on what country you live yeah. in, uh, <laughs> Marcus. You have to, some countries you'll get away with it. Yeah, but um, what I would do it depends on the, the seriousness of the offence. But I have stopped people diving before. Yeah, they said you're going to sit this one out. My, one of the uh, again, it's going to sound quite draconian, but it's only because I'm so passionate about marine life. If I was at, there was a couple of dive sites I used to work at where on, on a lucky day you might see a whale shark or a, a manta ray and it used to be part of the briefing we would specifically talk about interaction with these big pelagic animals look but don't touch this is that simple you know don't approach them from here don't go letting off flash guns straight in their eyes or don't chase after them and the final point of the briefing used to be guys are we all clear on that can I have a show of hands anyone not understand and if I find, you know, if we find that you, you have reached out and decided you're going to stroke down the side of a manta ray, your dive will be over then. The dive will be over and your, your equipment will be put in the engine room. You know, it's, it's, it's that simple. Um, and, you know, it's not often you, you, you're brought to that position, but sometimes you would have to say to people, these are the rules of the boat. You know, you have to abide by them. Yeah, uh, and, and often I, I find, uh, uh, Marcus, it's it's a lot of it's not intentional. It's just educating people. Yeah. You know, even though we're taught right from being an open water diver that you look, don't touch, it gets lost and forgotten, and the excitement yeah. and everything. And I, I think normally, from my experience, one single word about I saw you do this and done. And I, I've seen from my experience on the boards that that person doesn't tend to do, they don't really tend to be repeat offenders. No. Um, you know, you normally just a word would be okay and enough. Yeah. Often people, sometimes people are completely oblivious to it and 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 they, they look genuinely shocked and upset when they found out, oh, did I, did I really touch the, kick the reef with my fin or whatever the, the, it happens to be? And it can be, oh, okay, don't, don't, don't worry about it, but just be, be aware of your, your, the length of your fins and your buoyancy. And, and um, in, a, in a previous life, when I used to talk on a podcast on my own, I spoke with Chloe at Reef World, the charity, and, and her, her opinion was the same, as that education is the best tool. In yeah. that if, you can, if you can give people the information and help them to understand why something is, is, not, is frowned upon and, and, and not condoned, then... Generally, if as long as they they've got a modicum of common sense, they'll they'll they'll, they'll see that way as well. And it's a generational shift as well in that with each generation of divers coming through, they get more savvy about environmental interactions as, as with each generation. The days of people going down and prodding a, a puffer fish to it till it it blows up, uh, it hopefully, are pretty much gone now. You know. Yeah, if I if, if I witness somebody doing that, Marcus, they'd get a prod from me. I tell you, <laughs> and I'm not talking about the puffer fish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so they're they're sort of the challenges you face, and um, I suppose the only other one I would mention is people on holiday tend to get a bit more relaxed. They forget to take responsibility for their own diving, so you get this sort of air consumption poker with people where you you'll brief them and say, "Let me know at 120 bar." let me know again at 70 bar because then you as a dive master or instructor you know that 120 bar that might be my turn point or i'm going to bring the route shallower or whatever it happens to be and you'll get that person who just completely disregards anything you've said in that respect and you'll find yourself oh. 28 meters down and they're giving you a 50 bar signal and suddenly it's like, what? <laughs> or, or, or completely uh, lie you know they yeah. they think there's some bravado in oh i'm not going to tell him i'm down to 100 i'll wait until i'm 80 then i'll tell him i'm at 100 and that it's crazy yeah it's it's sometimes it's usually guys to be fair and i don't mean to be sexist against guys but it's our fault um, they tend to get a bit macho about it and those people who tuck their SPG into the cam band of their BCD so you can't see the gauge if, if you're if you're starting to because that means that they've got something to hide there um, so do, do have a look at that and if you're if you're new to guiding dives don't be afraid to just go over and, and have a look at their gauge if you're if you're unsure about it 
um, because people will they'll say they've got 130 bar and you'll have a look at the gauge and they've got 80 and they just don't want to be that person who, who says oh, okay we're gonna to have to turn the dive because of me which is mm -hmm. crazy because they're risking themselves and the other people just through this misguided perception that if you use less air or less gas that makes you somehow a better diver everyone's got yeah. their own individual physiology some of it is technique and fitness related of course but you know I'm, you know, a big guy is generally going to use more gas than a petite girl does. It's just the, the way it is, you know. Yeah, that, exactly that. That's how it is. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, the, the girls always tend to do better on air, especially those of a smaller physique. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, they're, they're sort of some of the challenges you get. I mean, I should sit down and write a book about it at some point. But, um, yeah, that's some... Um, that's what I was going to say. I mean, you must have some funny stories of of things that haven't of all those things that we've just discussed there must be you know funny outcomes to to some of the things yeah. where people haven't listened and haven't mm -hmm. done as you've asked them but have turned out quite looking back now seem quite funny yeah i mean off, often in hindsight these things seem a lot funny at the time they're they're a frustration there's one particular dive site um which is one of my favorites actually um called kotash i pinnacle which is up in the similan islands off the coast of thailand and it's a, it's, we just call it, it was nicknamed by the guides the Dome of Doom because it was, sometimes you get these amazing sort of swirling currents around them and it's this, this big kind of dome under the water. Starts at about 12 metres, drops away to 40 metres or so as you, as you get around the outskirts and there's these big granite kind of outcrops like Stonehenge all scattered around it. And you get life, lots of life there. But you used to get strong currents there and there was a mooring buoy on the top of this dome. And if you had people who perhaps weren't so experienced in current or didn't know or have the confidence to do a negative entry, what we would do is we'd speak with the captain, get the captain to, the, to bring the main vessel up current with a, with a, a nice sizable kind of um, space from this particular shot line or buoy down to the dive site itself. And on, on the signal, on the sound of the horn, we'd jump in and you'd go along and you'd grab the boy and we'd all grab the boy and then make our way down hand over hand so that people who didn't want to rush down because of their ears or their confidence or whatever it was had this opportunity and i just remember this vividly this this one um experience of that where my my kind of number two instructor on the boat was a guy called bart this polish guy and if he's out there bart i, I hope you're listening and he, he didn't have much hair to start with but after this day the rest of it was gone um and uh, this, uh, th he, had, he had this group of, I can't remember where they were from. I, th I don't know if it was Japan or China or Korea. They, they're of Asian descent, the, these guys. And we briefed them exactly this. On the signal, you jump in and f stay with your guide. Keep an eye on where the shot line is. Grab it with your hand. Each of you grab the line. When everyone, all three, four of you have got hold of the line, you'll go down together hand over hand. And the signal goes, Bart jumps in, these guys jump in after him, and they immediately just ignore Bart and start looking at filming themselves with their GoPros on the selfie sticks, float past the, the shot line, and then wear themselves out trying to get back to it. It doesn't work. Captain sends out the Zodiac, they're picked up. Take two. Exactly the same thing happens on the second attempt. And on the third attempt, this is we're getting on for about 45 minutes to an hour later, Bart just gave up and said, do you know what? You guys aren't diving at this dive site. It's just not happening. Because you can only tell people so many times, and you just ran out of time at this point, where divers who, who had already been in and done the dive were coming up, and these guys were still trying to get in the water and get to the shot line. Just, just yeah. as you touched on there, Marcus, um, you mentioned negative entry. Yeah. Um, when I first went on my first liverboard, I was advanced open water. Um, I'd done about 40 dives. Yeah. All probably, well, most of them in fresh water. I did a couple on the coast, but uh, in Norfolk, but that's walking from the shore into, into the sea. Um, and when I went on my first liverboard, they were talking mm. about negative entry and positive entry. And I had absolutely no idea what they were talking about or what I had to do or how I had to do it. So maybe for those listening and viewing, you'd give us a sort of brief on negative okay. and positive entry. Well, positive entry is, is what you learn when you start out. So you, you've got, obviously you can do a walking entry um, or you can do a deep water entry, such as a giant stride or a back roll or whatever it happens to be. Um, 
but when you do those entries, you have your mask on, reg in, your jacket or wing would be inflated. When everyone has completed that process on the surface, then you'd go down and make your descent as you've been briefed. The flip side to that is if you're at a site where, for example, there is strong current or you need to get down and out of the way of surface conditions as quickly as possible, you do a negative entry. And that would mean deflating your wing, your jacket, whatever buoyancy device you use before you get into the water. It's important when you do that to obviously hold the deflate button, do a little dance like a chicken to, to squeeze all the gas out of it. Don't in, I've heard someone recommend to inhale it and blow it out, but you get all kinds of fungus and gunk that can, can, can gather in, in the bladder of these things. So don't do that because you'll end up with some sort of weird chest infection if you do that. But just try and squeeze as much of the gas out of it as you can. And then on the signal when you enter, you, you'll agree in the, in the briefing, depending on the dive site and the environment, that you're going to enter the water with a completely empty jacket or buoyancy device. Leave the surface. And then as soon as you're a couple of arms lengths from the surface, when you, for example, you've done a giant stride in or you've done a back roll in, you'd flip up and kick down a few metres until the, the, the ambient pressure of the water helps to hold you down look around, check your buddy and the other people in your team are okay and you'd all meet at an agreed point. Whether that's the shelter of the side of a reef from the current or you've all agreed that you're going to meet at 10 metres or whatever it happens to be, you would then do that. So it's just a way of getting in quickly and safely and, and trying to stay in contact with your group as you do it. It can be like watching the Keystone Cops. If, if you're a guide and you do it, often what will happen is, I'll brief this, I'll get in, do a negative entry make my way down and as I turn then perhaps at five meters ten meters then flip around and just check everyone's okay and do a signal you'll see people at the surface because they've they've misjudged it or they're they're flapping around with their feet out of, out of the water in the air kicking away and these kind of things but when you get it right it can be a really good technique and it's one worth practicing I think we're talking about sorry in respect of what we're talking about I think for me it was not so much jumping off the back of the main dive vessel it was when you get on a rib so i've never done any rib diving mm. or zodiac diving and then on the way to the site you're sort of sitting on the side of this rib on the side of this zodiac they say all right we're going to do the negative entry here and you're going huh what? <laughs> what's that what what do i do how do i do it what, what are you talking about and because i was relatively new i didn't feel you know confident enough to ask as well because you don't want to appear stupid or silly do you so yeah. It was more in respect of diving off a, doing a negative or positive entry off a rib rather than off the back yeah. of the main vessel, really. Yeah, I mean, off a rib as well, or a zodiac, you just got to time it. You've got everyone needs to go at the same time. What you don't want to do is end up with you know half the people going on the wrong point because then the boat becomes unsettled and then you're in a whole world of pain. Or if people roll in and then the other person decides they want to do a final check of the mask and goes in two seconds later and they might land on top of someone. So you, you've just got to, it's all about timing and being prepared. With those sort of situations, again, that's an, it just underlines why the briefing is so important because if you've got any questions, if you're not sure about a technique that's been discussed in the briefing, go and speak to whoever's doing my job on the boat and, and get some tips on how to do it. And I'll, you know, I would then explain to people what to do and give them a you know normally get out clause of well if you don't feel comfortable doing that just roll back at the same time and immediately you find yourself righted and you you feel happy then deflate and go down immediately but um it's just being clear and and and, and paying attention to what, whatever the, the briefing is and the I procedures think another thing to that as well is just never be afraid to ask there are no silly yeah. questions are there i mean it's a lot easier to get confirmation on the surface um, before you drop under to, to just ask and just yeah. get so there are no silly questions when you're diving yeah yeah, the, the the only silly question is the one you didn't ask, Jim. That that's the that's the silly one. But I think I think you know we, what we don't want to do is give an impression that liverpools is purely for experienced divers. I think that that you know I, I've dived. I've I had a dive buddy that was very inexperienced and. She, she was only done 20 dives and she you could tell she was very nervous and concerned she was brilliant absolutely brilliant and yeah. and you know so so don't think that, that a liverboard is only for those that are you know really experienced uh, uh, divers because those little techniques just if you don't understand anything in a briefing or if you hear something you think what does he mean just ask the question and yeah. everyone will help you out 
I was going to say, most experienced divers will help those that are less experienced, like when the, the experience I was telling you about then, I was yeah. diving with really experienced people who were more than willing to help me improve my diving. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, it is. Yeah. It, if only you'd ask them the question to give them yeah. the opportunity, Jim. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But you know, I'm not very confident, so I don't ask too many questions. Yeah, I think the Liverpool as well is a really good opportunity for people's diving to grow and evolve and improve. And it's, I agree wholeheartedly with what you just said, Craig, in that I think back to one of the more recent Liverpools I've, I've done, um, I taught an advanced open water course on that liverboard. You know, it would be someone who's yeah. an open water diver with 10, 15, 20 dives. And that's a great opportunity to then hone your skills because you're doing it day after day, three, four times a day you're diving. Yeah. And instead of diving once every month or six months, if, you, if you're doing 20 dives over the next few days, you can learn, and then two hours later after a service interval, you can then put what you've just learned into practice one more time. So it's, it's a great way to improve your technique as well. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more, Marcus. I think the, 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 the two skills that people really need to now before they go on the liverboard is do the best you can getting your buoyancy now and send up an SMB and practice with an SMB. If you've got those two skills, you'll love a liverboard and everything else will come uh, and you'll improve on whilst you're diving. Definitely, yeah. Do you miss it? Do you miss do it being that guide trip leader? Yeah. <laughs> Well, there, obviously, there are some aspects of the life which is really, really nice. Um, but there, there are demands to it as well, because, as I said, it's a bit like being on this floating hotel or floating asylum, depending on the group you've got that week. And what you, you do lack is any, for, as it was someone working on board a vessel like that, you have no personal space at all. So if anyone's thinking of doing that as a job, you have to be prepared. You live out of whatever bag or rucksack you've got with you and be prepared any time of day or night for a customer to come banging on the cabin door and say, oh, what was the name of the blue fish we saw on the third dive today? Because I'm just filling in my logbook. Um, because that's just the nature of the beast. It's a hospitality business and it's a safety thing as well. So you, you, most of your time is taken up, if it's not doing stuff behind the scenes, it's just making sure people are safe and comfortable in the water. Brilliant. Uh, that was a fantastic insight. Right, Marcus, thank you so much for that. I think uh, uh, you certainly whet the appetite of a lot of people thinking now that, that when this lockdown is over, a liverboard might well be for them. Um, unless you've got anything else, Jim, I think what what would be great now is to run through our quickfire questions for, for yeah, Marcus. We'll quickfire we'll questions, haven't we? Um, we're just going to cut some questions out you, Marcus. Obviously, uh, we, mm. we haven't let you know what they are beforehand. We just want a quick answer to them in, in as few words as possible yeah okay no, nothing too challenging for you <laughs> okay okay so i think we're going to alternate on this uh, uh yeah. jim show should i start if you want to yeah okay marcus so how many dives have you done uh difficult to put a precise number on it probably around four thousand i'd say give or take a few hundred cool okay so what's the best thing about scuba diving I think it's the opportunity to see some of this amazing marine life and history of wrecks firsthand with your, with your own eyes and in your own time. I think it's amazing. Brilliant. So what, what's the worst thing about scuba? Um, that you have to come up usually. You normally, <laughs> you've, you, the laws of physics and uh, your gas consumption mean that, you know, after an hour, normally time's time. So, uh, being able to, it'd be nice to go down and just disappear for like a morning, wouldn't it? And just go yeah, that would be fantastic. Jim. Okay, so I kind of know the answer to this question, so I've adapted it slightly. The <laughs> question is, what's your favourite UK dive site? But we're going to say, what's your favourite UK dive site, excluding Scapa Flow? Oh, that's not fair. Um, <laughs> well, we're leaving Scapa to one side. Um, I've had some, some, some great dives on the Farne Islands. If you rewind... A decade or two um then when i started out i think that's a great uk site when the conditions are good for someone who's new to uk diving because there's a variety there some of it is you know relatively shallow where you're in the kelp with some seal interaction and similarly um you've got you've got the same thing somewhere like lundy island which is off the coast of devon um it's a really it's really tiny island so it's like craggy island and father ted and 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 around the outskirts of that there's some amazing stuff too so either one of those two so uh, then what's your favourite overseas site, Marcus? 
Uh, well, there's lots I'd like to go to, but Kotash Eye Pinnacle, um, Similan Islands, love it. My yeah. favourite, always. Okay, bucket list, Darth. Galapagos. I can't afford it. If anyone wants to set up some crowdfunding to send me out there, I'll be very grateful. And I'm, I'm willing to be your buddy as well. Oh, yeah. yeah and, and I'll bring the camera. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, sharks or dolphins? Sharks, always. Well, good answer. Yeah. Okay, so favourite wreck? Uh, SMS Colm, Scapa Flow. Interesting. I look forward to the Scapa Flow uh, uh, section later. Um, favourite wreck uh, he's just done? Favourite bit of kit and why? Uh, oh. Probably my dry suit, I suppose. I think um, they're much maligned by non-dry suit users and I wouldn't have been able to do my job without it. Yeah, I love dry suits. So yeah, love we're, we're both nodding in the background there. Yeah. Okay, so... If you could have one more dive before you leave this mortal coil, um, who <laughs> would it be with? And you can't choose me. Who would it be with? Yeah. It, would be, it would be my partner, Fern. <laughs> Obviously. Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. She's listening, isn't she? Yeah. yeah. Most, <laughs> mo most memorable dive, Marcus? Um, again, it, it, Kotash Eye Pinnacle. I was lucky and just dropped in in the middle of a big ball of barracuda and then a whale shark and a manta ray swung into view. Oh, how bad. <laughs> okay, so most forgettable dive. Well, I've forgotten it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> <He's an answer. laughs> I don't know, there, there, there are some, some, some sites that I, obviously when you're working, you do to death because you're training and doing tri dives at them. So one of those, I suppose. <laughs> All right, so to, to end the final question, what would you say, Marcus, would be the best way to encourage more people into diving? Uh, I think just to experience it for themselves. I think if, if, if it was offered as kind of a, a free experience, and that's what happens a lot abroad, abroad, you see people in hotel swimming pools doing little taster sessions. So I think that you can watch as many TV shows as you like but when you first breathe and blow some bubbles underwater, that's a, that's a game changer for most people. Yeah, I agree. That's yeah. I got started. Yeah, absolutely. Have a go, you know, for, for anyone that thinks they might like it, um, start maybe with just a snorkel. And, and if you like snorkeling, you're going to love diving. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So brilliant. Okay. So to wrap that up, thank you very much, Marcus. We really appreciate it appreciate you coming on really look forward to having a special on scapa flow in the future and uh, uh we'll get you back in a few weeks time to to do that jim anything else from you no i'll just reiterate what you've said really uh, it's been great talking to marcus as it always is um and thank, you, thank you very much yeah well, it's, been, it's been a pleasure having a chat with you guys we've been in lockdown for so long it's um it's almost a pleasure talking to you jim so uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah don't um, push it yeah so have a good day and I'll speak Almost. to you guys soon. Brilliant. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Brilliant. Thanks, Marcus. So thank you, Marcus, and uh, we look forward to having you back sometime in the future. Definitely looking forward to, to listening to some of those stories about Scapa Flow uh, and diving on the, the World War One fleet that was scuppered up there. So next we're going to talk about nitrox. This is one of the courses that is very easy for everyone to do at home whilst we're in lockdown because it doesn't actually involve uh, going diving. So get in touch with your local dive centre and see what they can do to, to get you set up with uh, nitrox. Yeah, there's, there's lots of all the agencies at the moment have got discounts and doing lots of incentives to get people to do this online now while we're in lockdown. So speak to the local dive centre and, and get yourself booked in because it'll help help them and uh, obviously help the, the wider dive community as well. Yeah, absolutely. So what is nitrox? So, so you're, you'll hear it referred to as nitrox or often EANX, uh, which is um, uh, enriched air nitrox. Uh, I had to just remember for a second there, Jim. Um, and basically, it's, it's where we have more oxygen content instead of our standard 21% in air that we breathe. You're a nitrox instructor, Jim, aren't you? Yeah, uh, exactly as you just described. It's in recreational diving, 
it refers to any nitrogen oxygen mix where the oxygen content is more than the normal, which is 21%. So anywhere from 21% to 40% would commonly be termed as nitrox or yeah. enriched air. I, I think the most common that people will tend to see will be uh, 32 or 36. It seems to be uh, uh, the most common EANX 32 or EANX 36, which means 32 or 36% of your total mixture is oxygen rather than the standard 21. Yeah, I mean, you often often see 32%, don't you? Certainly on the liverboard, it's around about, give or take, you know, uh, a couple of points, it's about 32%. So, yeah, I mean, but like I say, it could be anywhere, anything that's over the normal 21%, up to 40%. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so you instruct on nitrox. I've been a nitrox diver since almost immediately after my uh, uh, advanced open water. Why did we bother, Jim? What's the benefits of nitrox? The benefits to using nitrox, um, there's a few really. It allows extended um, dive times without the, the need for decompression stops so you get an extended bottom time yeah that for me as a photographer that was the, the the major thing and and we can give people an example there if you dive on 21 percent air uh, let's say 22 meters your no, no deco time will be 37 minutes with 32 nitrox that's 60 minutes with 36 nitrox that's 70 minutes so for me it was always all about that being able to, to stay down and take more photos yeah that's i mean that's a massive difference isn't it and for photographers um it's brilliant but the 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 other benefit you've got is obviously it reduces the risk of decompression sickness because there's less nitrogen so there's less nitrogen being absorbed into your bloodstream um it reduces the risk of that dcs so that's yeah. always good yeah. and the um another benefit is shorter surface intervals so you don't have to have such a long time to off gas while you're on the surface because there's less nitrogen in the bloodstream uh you can have a shorter surface interval yeah absolutely and it's a it's a great course to do but one thing we must say to everyone jim don't ever ever be tempted to dive on nitrox without being nitrox trained there are some downsides particularly with exceeding certain depths depending on the mix which can be very dangerous and oxygen toxicity um don't ever share a tank or somebody else's tank and you're not nitrox trained you need different equipment you must understand how nitrox works to be safe using it um, and the course is so easy to do at home so so go and do the training yeah i mean like you say oxygen is you know it, it's pretty useful and essential to life isn't it you know it yeah, is pretty pretty useful jim yeah pretty yeah. useful oxygen but, yeah i mean it is but yeah. but if you take that underwater and put that under pressure then it can cause um certain issues so i mean we won't go into that now um and we won't labor on that but yes you do need the right training and like Craig said, and you know, we, we do quite a lot of nitrox courses in our local dive center, and they are just it's just a classroom session, about two and a half to three hours long. The usual format going through knowledge reviews and discussing the questions and adding a bit of meat to the bones, if you like, to some of those questions. Yeah, and you know, there's there's a practical part to that as well, where you can get to try the analyzers that we use. It's just a really good fun course, but you won't be able to dive on nitrox unless you're fully trained and understand the, the risks to using it and the benefits as well. But it's a really great course. So um, again, that's another way of helping out your dive, local dive center, wherever that may be, um, and get yourself booked on because you can do that theory session now online and then the practical when the lockdown's over. Yeah, absolutely. And and uh, final final message on that, Jim. Why bother doing nitrox? We all love diving. If you can, if you can find anything that means you can stay down on a particular dive for longer, it has to be a great thing. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, Craig's got an uh, interesting story about jellyfish. What's, what's that all about then, Craig? So the, the Philippines, uh, particularly in Palawan at this time of year, normally is mobbed particularly with divers and obviously the beaches are empty the dive centers are empty and things are changing over there and all of a sudden 
there has been a huge influx of jellyfish. The, the Cranby only mass to go for is the okay. um, the official name, also known as the Tommaso jellyfish because they're a pinkish red in colour, but have arrived literally in their thousands. For those watching on YouTube, we'll post a, a photo up. Yeah, I've, I've seen that photograph. It's incredible, isn't it? Considering Amazing. how where. I mean, normally you don't see these things, do you? But this photograph, there's thousands of them. Yeah, oh, the Philippine uh, nationals do tend to fish for jellyfish as well. Um, but but uh, so that controls the numbers and obviously the fishermen aren't out fishing because they're also in lockdown as well. So it's a combination of the fishing not being there and no divers and no beachgoers. And so th there just seems to be this huge bloom almost of, of uh, jellyfish. Now I've got a couple of interesting jellyfish facts for you jim <laughs> craig's facts are brilliant yeah. so so 500 million years jellyfish have been around for uh, prehistoric and the jellyfish that we have now are so similar to the fossils that are found and, and jellyfish dating back right through that time and there's very few examples uh, in in um, natural history where that that is actually the case they have no brain, they have no heart, and they have no eyes. And 95% of a jellyfish is water. 60% um, of humans, as you know, Jim, is water. But 95% but of a jellyfish is water. And they are the most venomous marine animal in the world. The box jellyfish, particularly found in Australasia, that can kill almost instantly by causing a cardiac arrest. Um, some of the ones that we get in this country, if I come coming up from a dive and I've been photographing, uh, uh, you know, taking photos, and some of the, the lion's mane jellyfish we get around the UK coast are huge, you know, tens of metres of tentacles. I've seen, I've, we see a, see a lot of those like around the, you know, jellyfish around the, near the Farne Islands when we've been there diving with the seals yes. and some of those they're, they're incredible looking things aren't they yeah and, and great to photograph as well but it just shows you that the, you know the, the the way the environment is actually changing and i wonder when we all go diving again will they just disappear or are they now now oh well, yeah uh, i mean it's uh, funny isn't it there's there's a lot of stories out there at the moment about the recovery all around the world i mean we've seen things like um, and stories like octopus walking along deserted beaches now, coming out of the sea, walking along I deserted that, yeah. beaches, or the, the porpoises that I saw in uh, a river in Somerset, because there's more, an, yeah. an abundance of fish in there now. So you're getting porpoises coming up the river into Following in Somerset. The river. So, and Venice, like we mentioned on the last episode, that is now clear, the waters are getting really clear. So I think globally, with the lack of people, the lack of boats, the lack of um, pollution, it just, within weeks, we're show, showing a huge recovery globally. I just, I just hope it continues. I, my worry is that when we go back to um, these, the lockdown is um, relaxed a little bit and these various different countries go back, will we go back to how we were or will we have learned that you know, the planet is recovering and it can recover really quickly. I mean, a matter of weeks yeah. and it's already uh, But it's not it. just recovery, Jim. It, it's recovery and change as well. Because as the jellyfish is an example, that isn't normal. They don't see them in those numbers. So that's more of a, uh, an environmental change. So it's, it's recovery and change. And how will it change back? Will it change back? Or stay as it is as, as we go? We, we, we will hopefully be back in the water and be able to see. Exactly. I just hope we learn from it, though. That's my biggest thing, is that we learn that we have, you know, these changes have taken place. And it's probably because when we're all sitting in our houses instead of going out and, and making a mess of the planet. So, um, you know, hopefully we'll learn from that and we won't revert back to sort of how it was a few weeks ago. Let the, let the planet recover. We'll put a link on social media and that photograph of those jellyfish, won't we? Yes, yep, we'll do that so people can uh, see that if they haven't seen that story. So, what have we got coming up on the next episode, Jim? Yeah, it's actually quite exciting, Craig. We've got another guest coming in. We've got an interview with Mark Evans from Scuba Diver magazine. 
Hi, I'm Mark Evans, also behind the Go Diving show here in the UK. Uh, been in the industry for many, many years, and we know for a fact he has got some great stories. Yeah, we'll uh, look forward to speaking to Mark uh, next week. So that's it from uh, all of us here at the Dive Line podcast. A really enjoyable episode today. It was great to, uh, to have Marcus on as a guest. And as I said earlier, look forward to, to him coming back. We put all everything together that we do, costs you nothing at all. The only thing we ask is uh, if you're able to, please like, share, subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's all we ask. And uh, we look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Jim? Yeah, uh, exactly what you said. Just uh, like, subscribe and share. And it's really appreciated. That's the best way to support us. Uh, and, and if you've got anything that you'd like to to hear about or any suggestions, comments, don't hesitate to get in touch and, and also check into our website, thediveflying.com. Excellent. Okay, so we'll see you on the next episode. Goodbye. Goodbye.